Hello, everybody, and welcome to this exclusive podcast webinar titled Helping the Helpers and hosted by Mayor Brown, centering on the theme of what sport is doing to boost inclusion. We'll be exploring how sport can improve physical and mental health, build confidence and resilience and connect people with new networks and communities, but how there are few opportunities for migrant workers and ethnic minorities to play sport in Hong Kong. My name is Grant Buzevel. I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Valley Rugby Football Club, one of Hong Kong's largest and most successful sporting clubs, but also, quite proudly, one of the most community-driven clubs in the city. As a sponsor of Valley Rugby Club, Mayor Brown and the club enjoy a highly supportive and mutually beneficial relationship in a variety of ways. For example, Mayor Brown is currently assisting us pro bono with the establishment of a Section 88 charity that we're calling the Valley Foundation. The Valley Foundation will exist to create opportunity for Hong Kong's underprivileged children to participate in sports. The club and Mayor Brown strongly believe in the many benefits of sports for kids. Today, we'll be having a conversation with two proud Valley members who play rugby for our women's rugby team, Kaz and Rika also happen to work in the city as foreign domestic helpers that make up a workforce of 370,000 predominantly female Filipino and Indonesian migrant workers. We'll open the webinar now with a quick chat with David Ellis. He's a long serving partner at MB here in Hong Kong. There will be a live Q&A at the end. So if you have questions for Kaz and Rika, we welcome you to put them in the comments box. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We do hope you enjoy this webinar. Let's get on with the show. Okay, to kick off this session, we're speaking with David Ellis. He's a partner at Mayor Brown in Hong Kong, where he specializes in private equity real estate. Mayor Brown is a leading international law firm and its Hong Kong office is one of the largest and most long established in Hong Kong. It's been operating for nearly 160 years. David's been with MB for 30 years and describes himself as excessively loyal. Um, I would have said fiercely loyal. Uh, in his spare time, he's a keen yacht racer and his two children are both keen and accomplished rugby players. Hi, David. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you, Grant. Um, so we're here today to talk about what sport is doing to uh, boost inclusion, uh, specifically here in Hong Kong. So just quickly, what is your relationship with sport in the city and what impact or benefit does it have on your life, especially given the demands of your career and family? Yeah, so my, my sport is yacht racing. So this is what I do every Saturday afternoon. And one of the reasons I came to Hong Kong was I was, I was uh, driving down the M6 one, one December and I, I had a, a message from some of my university friends in Hong Kong and they were sailing in December and I thought, this is amazing, you can sail in December. So I one of the big reasons I moved out here. <clears throat> but for me, obviously, pretty stressful job and you get out on the water for a couple of hours on a Saturday afternoon and it, you just think about nothing else apart from how you can try and win a race. And uh, it, it, it really has a, a, a great effect on relieving stress. And when we don't sail during the summer months, I really notice <clears throat> how, that, how that builds up, um, the, the stress builds up over the weekend, whereas in the winter, it, it just dissipates. So it's been very powerful for me. Um, so, uh, but my access to rugby is not through me at all. It, it's through my, through my kids. So my youngest uh, boy, age five, he started playing. Um, he was, he was pretty good at it. Got quite a lot of uh, parental um, praise for, for running around fast. And uh, his elder sister, who was nine at the time, said, oh, I think I could do that. And I was thinking, well, you're a girl, girl, you know, girls don't play rugby, come on. But anyway, they did. And uh, at the club that they played at, they, they had a, a girls section. But actually at her age, she was nine years old. <clears throat> they played with the boys. And also by that age, it was full contact. I think nine years old is the first year full contact in, in Hong Kong. And um, she just loved it. I mean, she got slammed on the ground a few times and said, Daddy, it hurts. I was going, well, yeah, I mean, but you did want to do this. So, so oh, fine. So she got up and... Uh, she, she was um, actually uh, just as good, if not better, than her brother. So uh, they both carried on. She played for Durham University and is now playing, um, having graduated, is, graduated, is playing for a club in London. And my son is, is playing at school in England. So um, they, it's a big part of their lives. And it's been tremendous for their, obviously, socially and self-esteem, particularly for my daughter. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I can I can agree with you on all of that. I mean, I'm a father of three daughters, aged one, eight, and nine, um, and they play rugby. The eight and nine year old, they play at Valley. They love rugby. Uh, they they watched a lot of it on TV at very early hours of the day. But I, I love the resilience and self confidence that it's provided my daughters, and seeing the impact it has on the girls' teams is um, is really encouraging uh, and really great. Seeing that independence they develop. Now, Mayor Brown is very active in providing pro bono support in the charity sector and is, is in fact supporting Valley uh, RFC in establishing our own charity, which is called the Valley Foundation. Why does Mayor Brown involve itself in such pro bono projects? What are the uh, extrinsic and intrinsic benefits that come from this type of pro, pro bono project? So we have a couple of reasons for doing it. One is, um, uh, to be honest, is self-interest, and the other is a bit more altruistic. But I mean, just on the self-interest side, I mean, we are a business. Um, you know, we we make money in this city, um, and we all work hard, and so on. But but we recognise that we only make uh, a successful business from the society that we're in because the society is there and it functions well. Uh, and so it's important. For us that, that 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 continues and so we need to support the communities that, from which we uh, are based and this is true in hong kong and elsewhere in the world so that's the the, the basic um reason uh, and secondly of course it's it's the right thing to do and, and our people love getting involved particularly i say particularly the younger people but it's i mean that's perhaps not true it's it, it's 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 just become more and more true that people want to be involved and do the right thing for their communities um so we have a particular interest in in um, diversity and inclusion we we have uh, globally a project called project equity which originally arose out of the, the black lives matter movement uh, last year in america a and in asia we've translated that to uh, protecting uh, and helping uh, two three areas um, one of being one of which being uh, refugees migrant workers and and education for underprivileged people generally uh, and obviously this plays directly into that. What you're doing is, is fantastic, um, both from, from obviously from, from, from the women's side, but also for, for, for um, migrant workers. Uh, and it, it's a powerful motivator for our people. And um, it's, it's, it's just great to see the, the positive impact it has. Yes, uh, it's a big initiative for Valley, the foundation, um, and being able to, to offer something back to the community through an instrument like a, a Section 88 charity. Uh, it helps us sort of with our own sponsors and income streams. Um, and that those are very interesting to all of our sponsors and stakeholders within the community from the rugby union, um, other sporting organizations, but also our own members so that they can contribute as well. Um, Watch the space for our programs there. Uh, what advice then would you give to any organization that wishes to set up a Section 88 charity in Hong Kong? Yeah, so anyone can set up a, a sense of charity, but uh, the reason we call it a Section 88 charity is that you get a waiver from the inland revenue of the Section 88, uh, which means they won't tax you. So obviously there's a benefit to, to doing that. You can raise money and, uh, and any profit you, you generate, you can disperse to your charity and then have to pay the government. So uh you you need you don't need a lawyer but i suggest you do get get, get a lawyer to, to do the application it's just a bit fiddly um, and, and it requires a very sort of precise set of things to be done and boxes to be ticked um for you to get get through the various um hoops so uh i would recommend you get a lawyer to to do the application for you and hopefully you can get someone to charity you'll get someone to do it for you pro bono um, if you fit their their requirements, so uh, obviously that's our relationship with Valley, and and we're doing that. Yeah, and we're very grateful for that as well. I mean, when I uh, started looking at it myself, we have a few lawyers in the club, but everyone sort of uh, gave the dummy pass uh, on that one to sort of. So it's very good that, that Mayor Brown was able to get involved and benefit. You know, our relationship. Um, adds another string to it. Yeah, it helps if you've done it before. I mean, I, I, as I know you know, it requires patience to go through the process. Um, but it, uh, the thing is with the inland revenues, it takes them three months to respond to anything. So if there's any anything they have a question about anything, and then you answer, then it takes them, you know, they don't look at the file again for three months. So any question gives you, costs you three months. So best kind of get it as right as you can. Yeah. Um, and are there any other types of pro bono projects that Mayor Brown gets involved with? 
Yeah, so we we do a lot globally, and uh, in 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 America, you mean you can have people on death row that we're saving and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, one of our partners was uh, involved or led a commission to to uh, inquiry into the conduct of the Chicago police force. And she ended up, and she's now actually the, the mayor of uh, Chicago. So it says you have pro bono can lead you into a <clears throat> completely different career path. Um, in in Asia, it's it's a bit less dramatic than that, but but certainly for um, that we do things like uh, working for charities, do their basic uh, legal documents on a basic level, and for people like migrant workers, that there's a lot of you know unfair dismissals, uh, uh, dealing with the immigration department and that kind of thing. We're 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 very happy to to, to advocate for them against government or, or employers that are not treating them fairly. Yeah, that's great. It's really good projects. So. Um... Uh, David, thanks for joining us today to kick off this webinar. It's it's helped provide some context around uh, our relationship and, and what Mayor Brown does in the space. So thanks very much. Okay, pleasure and uh, good luck, Grant. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, here we go. So we're now going to start the main conversation for this webinar and we're going to welcome into the webinar Kaz and Rika. Hello, Kaz. Hello. Hi. That's Kaz waving and hi Rika. Hi Grant. Uh, good to see How are you. you. Again, yeah, it's great. Um, as you can see, Kaz and Rika are also members of the Valley uh, Rugby Football Club and uh, they play rugby for our Red Ladies women's team. And they're here today to discuss uh, how sport has impacted their lives. Um, before coming to Hong Kong, after coming to Hong Kong. And if you've got any questions along the way, please feel free to stick them in the comments box. There'll be a live Q&A session at the end of this conversation with Rika and Kaz. So that'd be great. Let's kick things off then with a little introduction. So let's start with you, Kaz. Why don't you tell us um, your, your, well, your full name, where you're from, um, which, which province, which country, how long you've been in Hong Kong and how old you were when you came to Hong Kong, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, my real name is Mary Floor, but they call me Cass. And then I am 33 years old now. I've been here in Hong Kong um, since, I guess it's eight years. I, I came here when I was 26 years old and I am a single mom. With two boys. Okay, great. How old are your boys, Kaz? Um, they age, uh, their age is 10 and nine year old. Okay, very cool. Uh, Rika, your turn. Name, where you're from, how long you've been in Hong Kong, how old were you when you came to Hong Kong? Uh, yeah, okay. My name is Rika Therese Tan and I'm from the province of Leyte in the Philippines and yeah, I came here, I was 23 years old when, when, way back 2015 that, that I decided to work abroad. And since that is the, the, the age qualified to apply abroad, that's why um, my first attempt actually is um, to, to apply as a factory worker in Taiwan, but unfortunately, I'm not qualified. So I don't have 72 units in my college. So I decided to come here in Hong Kong, um, work as a domestic helper, and yeah. Well, uh, things worked out well. You could still be working in a factory in Taiwan. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm not qualified <laughs> because of my height also. Your height? It's oh, failed. Wow. Yeah. That'd be the subject for a whole nother webinar um, about height restrictions um, <laughs> okay um, so yeah I mean that that must have been a big move in both of your lives uh, leaving behind your your families um, your support groups uh, your networks uh, especially for Kaz you know with a couple of, of young young boys um, what was the hardest thing about leaving home and, and coming to a you know a foreign place like Hong Kong very different to the Philippines uh, Rika, you go first. Um, the hardest thing is being far away from the family and relatives, and especially being the thought of uh, being homesick. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and sort of how, how crazy was it for you coming to Hong Kong? I mean, it's if you come from the provinces maybe into a, a big, you know, international city like Hong Kong, what were your first impressions? Uh, my first impression, um, when I came here in Hong Kong, my first, in, uh, yeah, it's a uh, mixed emotion, actually. My, I feel like uh, it's dream come true, I can go work abroad. <laughs> and yeah, but the other way around during that, that I had no idea whether I enjoy at least living here in Hong Kong, but I thank God now because I'm happy that here I'm blessed because I'm part of this team, rugby team and enjoy my life living here in Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay, how about you Kaz? I mean, it must have been quite difficult to leave Philippines with, with two young boys? It's really hard for me because um, um, when my kids is growing, I cannot be with them. And then their first steps of walking, I cannot uh, imagine it or I cannot see it. I cannot be with them when they fall. So that's the really hardest thing, uh, decision that I make. Yeah. Yeah. Here in Hong Kong. I can imagine, you know, I have three children and um, you've made an incredible sacrifice for, for, for your family. I mean, you both have. Um, so what was it like then arriving in Hong Kong and, you know, not having your support networks, your friends, your family? Did you did you know people, uh, Rico, when you got here? How how did you start meeting people and, and building back up networks and support groups and, and things like that? Um, uh, at first, um, yeah, before I don't have any friends here, only um, from the agency, maybe the, my fellow Filipina. And I found my friends in a church because on my holiday, I used to go to church. And yeah, and my friends, some of my friends here, asked me to join a um, sports, then, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, how about you, Kaz? How did you start connecting? And did you know people before you got here, other friends or relatives? Yes, for me, I've been blessed because I do have a lot of cousins here. <laughs> Thousands of cousins here, I guess. <laughs> and then I do have friends also. And my CFC family from from Philippines, so that's why I am confident a little bit <laughs> to come here. And then, so I, I am not really scared for coming here alone. Yeah. Alone. Oh, that's good. And how how were the early days for you coming here? I mean, not only you're coming to a new place that you're going to live for a few years but you're you're being employed domestic helpers you you you, you get assigned or you you join a family as an employer um, people you don't know and um, you may live you know with them in the same house it's a, it's a big adjustment so how was the early days uh, you know sort of adapting to living in Hong Kong in a, in a you know in par apartment sort of a environment with a with a new family you know, a new employer sort of thing. How challenging was it in those early days, uh, Rika? Um, my early days here in Hong Kong was quite hard mainly because it was my first uh, first time going abroad. Um, yeah, but um, adapting the environment job in my, my employer now is not that hard because they are kind to me. Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned uh, you're, you're onto your third employer now in Hong Kong, so you've... Uh, this is my second employer. Oh, your second. Uh, okay. The first one is, um, yeah, I break a contract, but I guess I'm not too, I'm not happy um, doing work in their house, so that's why. Okay. But I'm just blessed because I found this employer and they're kind, they're, they're good. Yeah. Can I just ask then, to be a bit nosy, what was difficult about the first sort of employer or the, or the household that you worked in? What made that um, difficult or, or challenging for you? Um, because of the communication barrier and the, their culture and like you're adjust, there's, I'm still adjusting. Um, so that's why. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's very challenging. Um, how about you, Kaz? What was it like in the early days for you and, and you know, your first employer and, uh, and, and you know, adapting to apartment life and living in with a, an employer? Um, same, I can say that uh, it's the same with Rika. Um, the communication is really, really hard for me because I'm living with, with Mama the grandma and with the two kids. And it's really hard for me because she came from mainland China. She cannot speak English, she cannot understand. So, so I just try my best to learn the basic Cantonese words so that we can, uh, at least we can communicate, hmm. just like that. Okay, and, and what, what sort of hours were you both working? I mean, were you, was it six days? Was it more? Or um, when would you start in the morning? And when would you finish at night? Did, did you finish at night? Or what was it like? Um, uh, me, my, my first employer, I need to wake up at six. And um, I sleep late. That's why not, um, like 3, 3 a.m. Because um, the kids are sick. So I need to take care of that kid. So that's why I decided to, my, and my health is not good at that time. Um, like I came here like I'm 50 kg and after three months I lost like 10 kg. So that's why uh, I decided to break my contract for that time. Do you, but, do you, was your health affected by, by work? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's tough. How about, how about you, Kaz? I mean, were you looking after children and what sort of hours and days were you working? Um, way back then, um, I started working at six o'clock. It's really the time uh, because they, they both go to school. So I need to prepare the breakfast. They're going to school. And then at night time, I finish my work at 10 o'clock because I go with them to sleep. I do read some stories. So I, so that, that's how my, my working days. And then I work six, six days in a week. So I, we just have one, one day off for Sundays. Wow. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you did not get a lot of free time in those six yes. days. Yes. Did, did you ever think I've made a big mistake coming here to Hong Kong and leaving my home? <laughs> uh, uh, me. <laughs> uh, for me, it's not a mistake, it, but it's a blessing for me coming here in Hong Kong. Um, yes, we all know that um, there's no place at home. And yeah, <laughs> and there are times that I wanted to go home because I miss my family, but um, I know there's a reason why I'm here and my goal is to have a great future here in Hong Kong. Yeah. Okay. Um, so on your day off, you, if you get one day off, I was, I assume that would have been Sunday. What, what would you normally do in your free time on a Sunday? I, I suppose you're quite tired and, um, you spent your free time just recuperating. What were you doing on your days off? Kaz. Me first or uh, it should be me. Um, during that time, um, before the COVID, I was a Sunday school teacher at Mount Carmel School, uh, Mount Carmel Church before. And then I go to training, the rugby, the exiles before. And that's it. Okay. So I've been spending my whole time going out, um, going with, with the other people, just like, it's so fun to be with, with, with them, rather than spend your, your time doing nothing, just like sitting down on under the bridge and then just like sleeping. So that's, that's how my day off is. Yeah, I mean, for our overseas, you know, viewers today, uh, Sundays is probably the biggest social event in Hong Kong is when all the, the, the uh, domestic helpers, there's about 370,000 domestic helpers, uh, their day off, they will congregate uh, in public spaces. Uh, it's, it's all around uh, Hong Kong, central seems to be where 
especially the Philippines domestic helpers, Victoria Park, uh, where the, the Indonesians tend to coin it. There's like literally massive crowds. There's it's very social. There's there's like sort of um, casual um, businesses operating. There is music. There is singing. There is dancing uh, and just celebrating their day off and being together. It, these are huge uh, times. And when when Kaz talks about sort of sitting under bridges. Um, the, the, the people are sort of exposed to elements. It's, it's either very hot or it can be raining. So they're always looking for great places to sort of stay out of the elements. Rika, what were you doing um, in, in your free time and your days off? Um, uh, I used to go to church, um, just stay at the church and play some guitar. And yeah, and sometimes uh, go for hiking with my friends. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yes, hiking the great. Yeah, hiking. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so let's let's now sort of come up to present day, or actually before that. Um, did did either of you participate in sports before you came to Hong Kong? Um, you know, at school or after school, once you'd left school, what sort of role did sport play in your life before you came to Hong Kong? Uh, Rika? Uh, me, um, yeah, I'm a sport, <laughs> you know. Um, me, uh, yeah, I used to play a lot of sport in Philippines. Like I play volleyball, basketball, badminton, table tennis. When I was in my school days, like elementary and high school. And yeah, I love sports. Okay, so sport was part of your life. Um, how yeah. about you, Kez? Also me, I was really i love ball games just like i play basketball um volleyball and ping pong and and also i become uh, just like a varsity player <laughs> that was really fun <laughs> in college day so really the sports is really really a big part of my life since then yeah since i was a kid yeah, I think in general, you know, in the Philippines, people are, you know, reasonably active, at, at least from secondary school onwards. Basketball is a huge sport, isn't it, in, in the Philippines? Um, I guess it was quite difficult when you first got to Hong Kong to be able to participate in sport because you're working six days a week, you're working long hours. On Sunday, you were talking about, you know, going to church and playing guitar and, and, and doing other things. So, um, how how did you start to get sport into your life? You obviously missed sport and um, wanted it to be in your life. How did you start to get more sport or activity, physical activity into your life in Hong Kong? Rika. Um, I start um, doing sports in Hong Kong uh, because uh, um, because I, I, I have a friend, like she's a sporty girl and she's like, oh, you want to join some sports? Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, I love sports. And then, then that, that's like, okay. And then she introduced me to play a rugby and rugby is like new for my ears because in Philippines, we don't have rugby. I, we, we have now, but it's not popular in Philippines rugby. It's like, What's that kind of <laughs> what's that kind of game? I was like, I'm so curious, and okay, I'm gonna go. <laughs> then yeah, that's the start. <laughs> well, that's pretty brave of you, you know, to take on not only a new sport but a sport that you know is all about well contact, um, you know, and that's that's pretty brave. I guess you started with touch rugby at first, so something yeah. about contact, okay. Um, and then what about you, Kez? How did you start to get sport in your life in Hong Kong? Um, me, um, we started, I started playing when I was introduced, or it was introduced by, by our coach, Tom, uh, last March 2016, just like that. And then um, it started there from Enrich. Uh, we are the ambassador at that time, so... So they 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 put up a team to, so that we could we could enjoy our our activities some just like hobbies. So they introduced rugby to us. So same as Rika, it's really new to us. So we, we're just oh, what sports is, is the one? How how to play? And then 
And that's the time I really love the that's the time I felt that I am being involved with, with rugby. Mm. What what did your friends say and your family when you told them that you were trying rugby? What was their reaction to this, Kaz? They don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they said, oh, that's really a physical a physical game. So they, they it could break your bones, something like that. It could so many accidents could happen in that game. So why did you just stop? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's my mother's and to me. What about you, Rita? Um, mine is like there's I was like, oh now I'm playing rugby and my friends, my relatives like, hey, are you an addict now? <laughs> because in Philippines, if you say rugby, you're a um what is that? Ex a solvent. Solvent. Yeah. <laughs> it makes you are a drug addict now. I was like, no, <laughs> rugby is a sport because they don't know rugby. What is, yeah. what is rugby? <laughs> It's wow. like, oh wow, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's dangerous, but yeah, we need to go training and able to go <laughs> for okay. a battle. Yeah. Did that make you feel like kind of proud that you were playing a sport that maybe surprised people? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what what about your employers? Did they know that you were playing rugby i mean you know imagine if you got a serious injury and couldn't work for a week that would be a problem wouldn't it uh yeah they know they know i'm playing rugby but uh they don't care they don't care if what i'm doing if I, in my <laughs> holidays <laughs> but they know they know i play rugby um actually my employer bought me uh rugby shoes <laughs> and, oh yeah. nice yeah they're they're so nice <laughs> That, that's your latest employer, right? Yeah, the latest employer. Because oh. the kids like to watch rugby and it's like, oh, you know, they, they told they told their mom, like, we guys playing rugby and they're like, oh, really? And they didn't, they didn't mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, I understand that your, your current employer is a member of a, a rival club. Um, that's me. <laughs> oh, that's me. That's me. That's that's me. me. My employer is a football club member, so he was playing at football club before, football club team, rugby team. So he had gear, he gave it to me, and also his, I think it's the protector, he gave it to me. <laughs> they're, they, they're really a supportive family. Yeah. So if the valley team is playing together with a football club, so we're just fighting. Oh, we win, we win. <laughs> we're so noisy watching together. <laughs> that's so yeah. funny. That, that's so amazing. And I, and I guess that's, um, that's, that's not, I don't know if it's unique, but having the support of your employer uh, is definitely going to help you, right? Uh, to, to be able to, to do sports and have time off, like on, on weeknights to go training. Because you mentioned working six days a week until... 10 o'clock at night or three o'clock in the morning, there's no way you can train. So um, you, you, it's, it's not, not lucky, but it's really fortunate that you find an employer that respects your time off, uh, supports what you do in your time off and actually lets you go when you need to, to train. Would you, would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you're lucky enough if you have a supportive employer and really, this would be a great help if um, um, it will, uh, it's a great help, but the truth, the truth of the matter is they don't care if you don't, if where, what, where you go in your holiday, like, yeah, but yeah, you're so, uh, you're so lucky if you have a employer that supports you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how did you, how did you meet? Valley. How did you come to meet people from Valley and eventually join Valley and, and play rugby for Valley? Kaz. Um, I guess it's it was June 2019 when I saw Rika, Rika and Celine join the Valley first. So before I was dreaming of playing with the Valley as well because I played with them before at South Island School together with with Coach Chris Garvey and I. I play with Riva, Rocky, and then Aki, some of the women's team before, and then we play touch. And then I really enjoyed the game. 
So I was thinking about joining, but I don't have the, the guts to, to ask on how to, to join because I, I thought, oh, I think there is a big amount of money, money I need to pay. So I said, oh, maybe next time or maybe I, I'll, I will just watch them. <laughs> just like that. Yes. Yeah. How about you, uh, Rika? How did you get involved with Valley? Um, our coach, Tom Walls in exile, the touch rugby, um, he messaged me because he know that I have a free time at night. So he messaged me if I want to join a contact um, um, for a beach five events that time. And I was like, oh, really? Contact? I was like, oh, can I do that? And he was like, um, well, you will, you will, you will, you, you need to do training first before you go to the, the contact one, the, the match. But if you like, you can go train with the Valley ladies. And I was like, oh, Valley ladies, oh, that's my <laughs> I'm their number one fan. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me try. <laughs> and then, yeah, I meet Dina, then Bella, TY. Uh, yeah, and then they're nice. The girls are nice. They're friendly. So it's not hard for me to join with them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, that's right. Tanya and Bella have done a great job of, of making rugby inclusive. And I understand, you know, I know that... Um, the, the subscription or the membership fees that most people pay to, to play sport in Hong Kong, it can be expensive, um, but you know, Valley and the Hong Kong Rugby Union has been very supportive in uh, making sure that those costs aren't being passed on to, to players that really don't have the financial means to play sport. And I'm, I'm sure like you say, that membership fees make sport sometimes non-inclusive you know, for especially for migrant workers like yourself, if even if it was five hundred bucks for a thousand dollars, that's a lot of money. Um, so more, you know, we feel that more clubs need to to try and you know give access to sport by subsidising and supporting uh, our members. Now, so how do you feel? Like what? How, how has sport benefited you or improved your life? Do you think um, not just it's fun to play sport, of course, but everything around sport, what has sport done to improve your life or make life easier in Hong Kong for you both? Um, Kaz, you want to start? Um, for me, um, I think sports is really a big thing for me. So um, I can't imagine my life here without the sport or without playing rugby here it might be boring at the first but now I'm enjoying staying here and then I'm planning in the long term to to play rugby more and then do some coaching and riffing as well the and then I want to give it back to my community yeah, that's amazing. I mean, that's that's the cycle of the, the circle of sport life. Um, but in, what about in terms of sort of networking and friendships and support and all that? I mean, at, at Valley, I mean, a lot of clubs are the same. We call it the Valley family. And does it does it feel like family? Yes, I I, I really felt that we are just sisters there with the Valley women's team. Um, they 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 welcome us with, with just like an equal equal teammate or equal. They are not looking at us as a domestic helpers, so they were just treating us as a same, the same with the other um, with the other teammates. Just like a sisterhood, it's been there. Yeah, and I guess um, the, the, the outside of rugby and sport, then. Does that boost your self confidence and your your self esteem? Yes, yes, it is. How about you, uh, Rika? Um, how has sport, you know, impacted your life uh, in Hong Kong and, and benefited you? Um, sports really improved my life. Um, it helps me control my emotion and channel negative feelings with positive ways and. Um, it leads to be, um, it makes me feel confident and um, 
um, sports makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the main thing. Isn't yeah, it? and and yeah, I learned um, to socialize because of the sport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's an important part of sport is the socializing and, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the net networks and friendships. And I like the, the term sisterhood because um, that's, you know, the men's teams, we have five men's teams, you know, we have three teams called the brothers, you know, the community teams, we have the performance teams. We have two women's teams. We have about 70 women now. It's, it's uh, the numbers have really grown this season and it really is a sisterhood. It's, it's, I mean, even looking from the outside, you can see that straight away. I love seeing, you know, there's, there's mothers of children. Um, there's people of all different backgrounds. There's just the children of our mothers are coming down as well and joining the club. Okay, so what advice would you give to others about, you know, sport? Um, let's say from similar backgrounds to yourselves. Um, some people stop playing sport and some people have never played sport. But what advice would you give to others, Kaz? For me, I should say, um, whatever, whatever sports you may take or try new things, everything will, will look fine if you try and learn about it. So, and then you put your heart on it. You love the sports that you involve. So that's how, how worthy your time with together together with other people, socializing with other teams. So I think more on trying new things and then more on communication to your boss. Maybe it's a big thing on, on asking them on, on how you can involve to that sport. So that's it for me. Yeah, thank you. Rika? Um, advice for... Is it always the question again? <laughs> yeah, sure. what, yeah, what advice would you give to others that were maybe in a similar position to you? Okay. Maybe, you know, D18 uh -huh. that come over about, you know, continuing sport or starting sport, even if you've never played, to, to impact your life in Hong Kong? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, even if we are a uh, migrant worker here, we should not be afraid to join any sports here and that 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 you will like um, any sport that you'd like and it's hard um it i know that it's depends on the situation um here in hong kong that um um that you can join any sport because i know that um the situation you're tired of your employer but yeah but if you have a uh, time or like um yeah, um, if you have a free time, free, um, if you can join at sports, then then you go. You need, you need to try. <laughs> How would you feel if someone told you you couldn't play sport anymore, Kaz? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I will be sad for me. <laughs> Yeah, why? How about you, Rika? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking the question to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, me, um, I can't imagine my life without sports. And yeah, I think it would be boring and dull. And uh, yeah, if, um, if people will ask me, you cannot jo um, do sports anymore, uh, I don't know what's going to be happening. <laughs> Well, if someone told me that, I, I would cry for a week and um, <laughs> I would find out a way to make it happen. So just finally, what are your, what are your long-term goals with sport and physical activity? What, you know, do you have any goals or dreams or what you'd like to do with sport, Kaz? Um, me, I'm planning to, yeah. As I said, I want to do more on, on I want to improve myself first to play in playing contact. And then I want to do the refing that I, I, I just finished, the level one. And then I want to do the level two, I guess. And then I want to do the coaching as well. And then I want to share it to, to my domestic helpers community so that I, I will give it back to them. I will share 
all what I've learned to them so that they will be just like me. They will enjoy their lives staying here in Hong Kong and then they will love to stay here. I love that. Yeah, I love that, Kaz. I love that you're going to pay it forward and, you know, contribute back, you know, to your to other net networks and communities. I think that's amazing. Um, how about you, Rika? Uh, my long-term goal uh, is to become a trainer someday <laughs> and uh, a varsity, maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. All right, well, I think um, we've covered everything today. I want to thank you both for uh, joining the conversation and being so open uh, and sharing your experiences. And, you know, if you can um, inspire others, then, you know, you've done a great job today. I'm very proud as the COO of Valley, you know, to have members like yourselves that are, you know, in our club, you know, just regular members of the club like everybody else training hard playing hard you know and being being just good people in the community and taking sport back to your communities i think that's something myself personally but also as the club we're very sort of proud of all of our members like this so thanks so much for joining um i think i hope the viewers have got some value out of this so kaz rika thank you very much Thank you, Grant. You're welcome. Thank you, too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.